good grains and bad grains. Not all grains are created equal, and that means that you can have a little bit of flexibility with some kinds of grains. But other grains, I feel like you really should be avoiding. And it comes down to just really how they react within the body. The body gets a little bit confused with specific grains. And all has to do with some complex stuff known as prolamins, but I'm gonna make it very, very simple. By the end of this video, you're gonna be kind of a pseudo expert when it comes down to grains. But more importantly, towards the latter half of this video, I'm gonna give you grains that I approve of and grains that I think you should stay away from. Now, granted, this is not necessarily applicable towards a low carb or keto lifestyle, but it definitely could be applied if you're doing an intermittent fasting lifestyle. You are tuned into the internet's leading performance, nutrition, and fat loss channel. New videos on Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday at 7 a.m. Pacific time, and a bunch of other videos throughout the week as well. Why don't you go ahead and hit that red subscribe button, and then hit that funky little bell icon to turn on notifications. I also want you to go ahead and check out ButcherBox down in the description below. So if you're someone that eats high quality meat, well, then honestly, ButcherBox is going to be the best alternative for you rather than the grocery store. You can get your grass-fed, grass-finished meat delivered right to your doorstep, cheaper than you would find it at the grocery store. And additionally, you're saving some extra money by getting it through me, so get it down below in the description. All right, let's go ahead and let's break this down really quick. So when we look at grains in general, the first thing that people think of is gluten. They think of wheat and gluten. But when we actually pay attention to what's happening when we consume wheat or when we consume grains, we realize that although gluten is kind of the common denominator, we really have issues that go far beyond that. So let me break this all down. Within any kind of grain, we have four different proteins. Okay, we have glutalin, we have prolamin, we have albumin, and we have globulin. Okay, now these all play a role and we're not gonna go into detail on a lot of them, but what I will say is that gluten is not necessarily a constituent of a given grain or of wheat. It's, it's more so a molecular combination. What gluten is, is a combination of glutalin and prolamin. That equals gluten. So believe it or not, gluten itself isn't really the problem. The problem is something known as gliadin. Okay, now what gliadin is, is a soluble fraction of prolamin. Okay, so really gluten is a combination of prolamin and glutalin, but the actual problem that a lot of us face with gluten, whether you're celiac or you just have a sensitivity, is actually a component of the prolamin. And the reason is, is it's actually a primary antigen. So when someone has celiac disease, they end up with an antigen response. They have an antibody response to the gliadin, to that specific prolamin. Okay, so this is where things get really interesting though. And here's when you actually break it down, it all makes sense, right? Some different grains have different combinations of proteins. And what ends up happening is lines get crossed, like which grains have proteins that ultimately equal gluten, right? Like we can have a grain that has albumin and prolamin, or we can have a grain that has globulin and prolamin, Okay, so we can still have that prolamin even if it's not gluten, but let's break it down further. And I know this is complex, but trust me, it will make sense. An example would be in wheat, the prolamin is gliadin. In corn, the prolamin is something else known as zein. In rice, it's a raisin. In oats, it's avenin. My point in saying all this is that all grains have some combination of these proteins. And a lot of grains, almost all of them, have prolamins in them but only a couple actually have the prolamin that's gonna to lead to gliadin. So what I mean when I say this all is that different grains will still have a crossover effect that causes us to have a problem. Now, gluten is not just an issue for people with celiac. Gluten causes an immune response within the body because it's been consumed so much. Okay, we have consumed so much gluten over the past 50, 60, 70 years that we have actually evolved into people that don't metabolize gluten as well. We have an IgA response. Now, a lot of that has to do with what are called WGAs, okay? Wheat germ agglutinins. It's a hard word to say, we'll just call them WGAs. WGAs are essentially a form of lectin. And what happens with this is they cause glycoproteins to stick together. Now, again, that's complex, but what that means is it causes the proteins to glob together in our gut, even if they're not gluten. Even if they're not gluten, so that means rice and things like that can cause this. They'll uh, clog up and it resembles a celiac response. 
And it's all because of the immune system and because of the mechanical act of it globbing up in our intestinal tract. So yes, even if you don't have celiac, you can have a crossover response from corn, from rice, from oats, from anything really, if you have the right proteins in line. And I'm gonna break this all down when I give you the best and worst. Okay, so if someone has celiac and they have rice, sometimes they'll have a celiac response and they're like, I didn't have gluten, but they still had a response because their immune system is getting confused. Now what this does when we have these glycoproteins stick is it causes our red blood cells to clump together that kills our immune system, causes a lot of issues, but also blocks what's called leptin. So for those of you that are in the fat loss world, leptin is what communicates from the fat cell to the brain to tell the brain that, hey, we have enough fat on hand so you can rev up the metabolism. It blocks leptin. So it blocks, it cuts the, the cord so that the fat cell cannot call the brain and tell the brain it's time to burn fat. So yes, you can store a lot more fat if you are eating the wrong grains. Okay, so now I wanna break down the safest, but I also wanna break down the ones that you should exercise a little bit of caution with, and it all comes down to the combination of what proteins and what, uh, you know, which ones have gliadin and things like that. So let's go ahead and let's break down which ones are good, which ones are bad. Now, of course, there's a lot more than just this. There's tons and tons of grains out there, and I'm gonna break it down a little bit more, but these are kind of the basic ones. The safest, there's a great grain out there called teff. Okay, teff is probably the lowest inflammatory grain that you can find. It's similar to quinoa. It's, it's kind of like couscous, but couscous is wheat, so we don't want couscous. So teff is really, really cool stuff. I recommend that one. So if you're on an intermittent fasting lifestyle and you're not doing keto, this would be a great thing for you to add into your, uh, to your nightly mix after you break your fast. Just a great, good quality grain. Uh, quinoa. Quinoa is pretty darn safe. It doesn't have gliadin in it. It's the combination of the proteins that are in there are usually pretty safe and people don't usually have a heavy immune response with quinoa. However, it does have some of the actual amylase inhibitors. So it can mechanically be hard to break down because it doesn't digest all the way. So just note that. Okay, buckwheat doesn't have gluten, doesn't have gliadin. You're safe to go with buckwheat. So buckwheat flour is a great thing to cook with. Okay, then we have tapioca starch and arrowroot starch. If you are on a low carb diet, these are really great because they hold a lot of water. So you can get by with a little bit of tapioca and a little bit of arrowroot and it goes a long way. It's a great thickener. I recommend it over cornstarch. Cornstarch is highly genetically modified, which can cause some issues and that's a story for another day. So go for tapioca or arrowroot, much better. Rice, you have to be careful with rice. I recommend going for wild rice. Okay, that way you're getting a full spectrum of nutrients. Brown rice can be hard because the shell literally is hard to break down. It's a shell, that brown rice outer casing. And then white rice, a lot of times we have a high degree of these WGAs that cause a side effect that's not directly related to gliadin, but it's directly related to sort of the clumping, okay, of those uh, glycoproteins. So we gotta be careful with rice. And the same thing with corn. Anything that's mass produced in a crazy way like that, a lot of times we have this crossover and this cross contamination. So we just wanna be careful there. But these are what I would say are the safest ones. And those are the ones that you can kind of lean with. Now, of course, uh, you can always use other starches like potato starches and things like that, but those aren't grains. So we're not gonna go down that rabbit hole. Ones I want you to use caution with. Wheat, obviously. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you have celiac or not. We have immune responses to wheat, and I've talked about it in other videos. When you look at frozen plasma and frozen blood cultures from 1946 compared to today, they have different responses to modern day gluten. The older frozen Sarah didn't have an issue with the gluten, but today's plasma does. It's us that's changing, not just the wheat. The wheat's changing too, but we're changing because we've consumed it so much. So if anyone tries to tell you that gluten-free is a fad, well, it's not a fad, it's legit stuff. Okay, rye, definitely wanna be careful with rye. Still has gliadin, okay? It's not wheat, but it still has the gliadin in there. Spelt, you definitely wanna be, uh, be a little bit cautious of salt. I don't wanna say afraid of it, but you wanna be cautious of it, okay? Because a lot of times people will say it's a gluten-free flour, but no, spelt still has gliadin, it's dangerous stuff. Barley, again, still in that same classification. And then we have uh, farro and durum. Okay, we wanna be careful with those flours. A lot of times people will say, oh, ground farro, anything like that, or durum flour, it's good to go. No, it's not. These are, they're twisted around. Oh, they're whole grains, they're healthy grains. No, they're still full of gliadin, they have gluten, we don't want that. That's gonna be hard on your system, especially after you've been fasting and your body's gonna be sensitive. One that I didn't put in here is oats, because oats is a bit of a wild card. Technically, 
oats don't have gluten, but most of the time you're going to find brands that still have oats that contain gluten because they're harvested in the same fashion and there's a lot of the same cross-pollination. A lot of times they'll cycle through wheat harvest and then replant oats in the same area. So a lot of cross-contamination at the farming level and of course at the machine level. So you have to be really careful. When, it's, when there's cross-contamination at the farming level, you're going to get a good amount of gliadin still in your system. So that's the breakdown. If you're fasting and you're just wanting to break your fast with good clean grains, these are the ones that I recommend. Okay, stick with those. Even if you're doing keto, these are going to be lower glycemic and a little bit safer if you want to have some starches now and then. Anyhow, I hope this cleared some stuff up. I know it's a complicated topic. If you want more of the grain brain science, I'm happy to dive into it, but I wanted to test the waters and see if it's something that you guys want to hear about. As always, keep it locked in on the channel. See you in the next video.